This week on The Gadget Show, is the iPod still king? I test it against the latest opposition to find out. Jason tries out the promising new technology that could finally make us love 3G. Tom Dunmore checks out the latest and coolest mobile phones, and we show you how a little prep will make your digital photo prints much, much better. But first, here's Susie. Cycling, says the handbook, is a pleasure that's simple and cheap. With a bit of work, it's possible to turn anything into a gadget. Just look at what this chap achieved with an old sit-up-and-beg bicycle. The radio is medium and shortwave and, of course, with aerial. Television will follow. There's a miniature motor to take him away from it all. But, brother, who said you can't take it with you? Well, thankfully these days we've moved on a bit and even if you don't attach a radio or a motor to your bike, it's still a very, very sophisticated bit of technology, especially if it's a mountain bike. Yeah. You ready? Tonight we present the Gadget Show's guide to buying the coolest gadget on two wheels. Whether you intend to ride up an alp, save the planet by riding to work, or just pull off the clever trick of looking butch in lycra, a mountain bike is an essential weapon in the armoury of any serious gadget fan. You need one and you want one, and we're here to help you make the right choice. But first, a little mountain bike history lesson. Mountain bikes first appeared just over 30 years ago in Marin County, California. Some locals found a disused track in the hills, which they thought would be fun to race their bikes down. The road dropped 1,300 feet in just over two miles, which meant the riders reached some pretty spectacular speeds. As more and more people descended on Marin County, regular races began to be organised, and the bikes were customised for the express purpose of careering down a dirt track at high speeds. Knobbly tyres, better brakes and wider gears appeared. Racing spread across America, and some of the early pioneer setup companies to produce these sturdy off-road bicycles. One of them, Gary Fisher, coined the term mountain bike, and it stuck. By 1996, mountain bike racing had become an Olympic sport, and these days, mountain bikes support a massive global industry worth $20 billion a year. But unless you know your stuff, coming into a shop as well stocked as this one could be one of the most confusing things you'll ever do. In this one shop, there are hundreds of different bikes. So how on earth do you know which one's right for you? Well, as ever, The Gadget Show is here to help. Stick around, because later I'll give you our definitive guide to buying a mountain bike. Now it's time for another of our short guides designed to help you get the most from your gadgets. This week, how to prepare your digital photos for printing. You no longer have to go to a high street developer to print out your prized photos. More and more of us are printing at home. But before you click on print, here are a few tips to help make your photos look the best they can. Most of us use a camera in auto mode, a general setting that guarantees good but not perfect results. To make your picture look a lot better, you can doctor the contrast with some photo editing software. Picasa is Google's free offering, which is dead easy to use with quick fixes, where a single click can automatically remove any red eye and adjust colours, contrast and brightness. But this may not be enough to improve your pictures. Ideally, you want the blacks to be properly black and the highlights at maximum brightness. If you don't do this, the printed picture will often lack bite or look dark. If you have relatively sophisticated software like Photoshop Elements, you could adjust the levels on a histogram for greater control. The histogram shows the brightness distribution of all the pixels in the photo. Tweak the sliders so the darkest pixels are black and the brightest pixels are white. Now it's a good time to play with the colours. Increasing saturation makes things more vibrant, but overdoing it will look unreal. Adjust the white balance for a warmer or cooler effect. If the colours are sickly, why not remove them altogether? A simple snap suddenly becomes a thoughtful portrait. 
If there's something spoiling your photo, then do what the professionals do and crop it out. It's a simple enough process. Just drag the borders of the photo so that annoying background disappears. But if something still remains, you can try cutting out the subject to isolate the background and create some eye-catching effects. If there's simply too much empty background in your photo, try pulling down the top and pulling up the bottom, thereby creating a dramatic, panoramic landscape. The paper you print on is a vital factor. Unsurprisingly, manufacturers' own papers often work best with their printers, though do experiment. In the printer settings, try and match the printer as closely as possible with your paper. Better quality papers, like Epson's Premium Glossy, absorb more ink, so you get a deeper coloured, more contrasty result than you would do on cheaper papers. You can spend hours fine-tuning a photo, but a few simple tweaks like these will dramatically improve your prints. I have a dream. A dream of a world where we can all be free. Free to access the internet wherever we want. And I dream of that access being cheap and reliable and fast. Then the dream ends and I wake up in the real world. Where we should have fast, reliable, cheap mobile connectivity. When in fact all we've got is 3G. Yes, it's time to talk about 3G again. Over the last few series, we've tested it a lot, and we've never really been satisfied. It just hasn't been the experience we hoped for. The one good thing about 3G used to be its value for money. These days, though, even that selling point seems to have disappeared. When I'm filming for the gadget show, I generally spend a lot of time in places like this. Hotel rooms. And I bide the time by going online and play my favourite game, World War II Online. More often than not, I use 3G to log on, and that can now cost up to £3 for one meg of data. That means a four-hour gaming session could cost me around £16. 16 pounds. 16 quid! Yet again, 3G has let me down. I've stuck with it, I've stayed faithful, and yet once more, 3G has bitten me on the bottom. You know, it might be about to change. Why? Well, because of something that's happening here, on the Isle of Man. I know, this sleepy little island doesn't immediately strike you as being on the cutting edge of modern communications technology. But it is. Manx Telecom is owned by O2, and they use the island as a self-contained test site for all the industry's recent advances. They were the first to introduce a GSM network, were among the first to introduce ADSL broadband, and the island had the first 3G network in Europe. And now the Isle of Man has another first, the first active HSDPA network in Europe, and I'm here to check it out. So what is HSDPA? Well, it stands for High Speed Downlink Packet Access. And it's kind of an upgrade to 3G, kind of 3.5G if you like. It works by making the process of sending and receiving data more efficient. And that means faster. Imagine this stick with a bit of seaweed on the top of it is a mobile phone mast. And this circle is the area it covers. It's got to look after all the mobile phones inside this ring and share its available bandwidth with all of them. Where HSDPA triumphs over normal 3G is that it's got a new computer brain inside the mast that can tailor its connection to each individual phone to their particular circumstances. 
if you're right next to the mast, you're going to get a smooth connection anyway. So the new technology shares some of your available bandwidth with the guy who's right over here on the very edge, giving everyone a fairer share of the bandwidth and a more consistent connection. Also, if you move, the new brains know and can respond themselves instead of having to report back to base like 3G, saving time and speeding things up. Finally, and more crucially, there's just more room with an extra channel for data to go down. It's like adding an extra lane on a motorway. There's just more room for more traffic and everyone ends up going faster. How fast? Well, at the moment, they're getting real-life top speeds of up to 1.3 meg a second. That's faster than lots of people's broadband connections. Towards the latter part of the year, they'll be getting 3.6. And next year, when the equipment to receive it becomes available, we could be seeing speeds of up to 14.4 megabytes per second. For now, though, it's the 1.3 meg that's the maximum, and the Lucky Manx early adopters are using it right now. But does it really work? Or is it just another 3G white elephant? Well, there's only one way to find out. A quick trip to the Max Telecom shop, where the gadget show's presence on the island was enough to cause a media frenzy. And for £49.99, pence, I'd pick myself up a small slice of the future. Thank you. Because HSDPA is in its infancy, there's no dedicated mobile phones yet. You can only access it at the moment through a data card like this. Wow, that's fast. We're in. I'll click on Internet Explorer. And there it is. 5.TV gadget show in all of its glory. It is very quick. I mean, these are big images. Um, and this site on my laptop when I'm using uh, 3G at home in the UK, um, actually, some of it is quite slow to load. This, I mean, I, just watch for yourselves, look. I'll just go forward, go to page five. Watch how quick it is, look. It's there. That is genuinely fast, and it's not even running at full pelt. The HSDPA is just giving me what I need for my surfing. In this case, 740k per second. But even that's bigger than a lot of broadband connections. It's unbelievably quick. Look at that. It's buffering in just about four or five seconds. That's fantastic. It's there already. It's there. That's absolutely amazing. Really, so really impressive. I, I'm of a mind to get a very small one-bedroom flat in the Isle of Man right now. That would be the only way I could get HSDPA this year. It's looking like the start of 2007 before we'll see it in the UK. But when that happens, if it happens as well as it has on the Isle of Man, I really believe I'll finally be able to do a piece for the gadget show called I Love 3G, or something like that. Now it's time for our regular look at some of the coolest gadgets around. This week, the latest mobile phones. Here's Tom Dunmore with The Critical List. The mobile phone market moves so quickly, it's really hard to keep up with what's happening. But this year's new crop of phones is smarter and sexier than last year's. Take this for example, this is the Motorola V3i, and it's the latest version of our favourite phone from last year, the V3 Razor. What's different about it? Well, for a start, it's got a 1.3 megapixel camera in it. And also, it has a space for a tiny memory card. And that means you can use it to store movies or music. In fact, in many places in the world, this comes preloaded with the iTunes music software. Unfortunately, in the UK, it's actually really hard to get a phone that does have iTunes on it. LG has given us an exclusive peek at two of their forthcoming phones uh, and they're really pretty impressive. First up is this one, it's codenamed Chocolate and it's already proved hugely successful in Korea where it's selling more than 4,000 units every week. It's not hard to see why, it's a fantastic bit of design. It's only a GPRS phone but it's got everything you'd expect, uh, including a megapixel camera, and an MP3 player. But the important thing is the design. It just looks fantastic, and it's got this little touch-sensitive display at the front, which allows you to control the phone even when the keypad is closed. Now, the specs for the UK launch haven't been confirmed yet, but one thing's for sure, it's going to be a success. And this is the snappily titled U890i. 
It's a follow-up to the U880, which was the first 3G clamshell that didn't have a severe weight problem. And this one is even thinner. In fact, it's the thinnest 3G phone in Europe. But it's not light on features. It's got this swiveling 1.3 megapixel camera that works for video calls as well as stills. And it's also got a built-in MP3 player with a memory card that allows you to store over 100 songs on the phone. But the best feature has got to be the inclusion of a new version of Bluetooth that allows you to stream music from the handset to a pair of wireless stereo headphones. Sony Ericsson's P990 is shaping up to be one of the big smartphones of 2006. This is just a prototype and it's not fully working, but on paper it looks really good. It looks similar on the outside to the old P910, but inside it's got Wi-Fi and 3G, hence the video camera on the front. It's also got an improved stills camera, this is 2 megapixels. And if you flip this down, it's got a whole new keyboard that makes text messaging and emailing much, much easier. It's also got a touch screen, and because it runs a Symbian operating system, you can add your own applications. Of course, it's got an MP3 player and an MP4 player too. It is a fantastic phone, but it's going to face some stiff competition from this, the N80 from Nokia. This is Nokia's 3G smartphone, and although it doesn't have a touch-sensitive screen or a QWERTY keypad, it is much smaller than the P990 and it has a 3 megapixel camera that's good enough for print quality pictures. But the best thing has got to be the fact that this is the first ever phone to be compatible with universal plug and play. That means it will automatically find any wireless home entertainment kit you've got and stream content to it. So you can send music to your hi-fi or wirelessly stream video to your television. It's an incredible device, which is why the N80 is my tip for the top in 2006. When you're taking a photo, it's important to get the right bit of the picture in focus. Luckily, almost all modern cameras will do the focusing for you, which saves a lot of time. It's called autofocus, obviously. But how does it work? Well, there are two different types, active autofocus and passive autofocus. In general, compact cameras like this use active autofocus. Now, when you half press the shutter release button, the camera throws out a beam of infrared light from a tiny emitter next to the lens. It measures how long it takes for that infrared light to hit the subject and bounce back to the camera. And of course, because it knows how fast the infrared light is traveling, it can work out the exact distance between it and the subject. It then adjusts the focus accordingly. Smile. On more expensive SLR cameras like this, a different type of autofocus is used, passive autofocus. And this works much more like the human brain does. Let me explain. This image is out of focus, it's blurry. What that actually means is that all the edges are soft. Now, look here at my shoulder and arms. There are no distinct edges. One thing just kind of merges into the next and you can't see the detail. As the image comes into focus, the brightness between adjacent pixels changes much more sharply. To figure out whether the edges are sharp, the camera moves the lens in and out, looking at the pixels in the image. And it stops when the contrast between adjacent pixels is greatest. At that point, the edges are sharpest and the object's in focus. The main problem with both types of autofocus comes when there are several objects at different distances in the frame. Normally, the camera will focus on the closest or the biggest objects in shot, and that might not always be what you want. So, if you're having trouble getting the right things in focus, try the following tips. Put the subject in the center of the frame, half press the shutter button to lock the focus, and then reposition your shot to a more pleasing layout. The more you zoom in, the less depth of focus you get, and the more precise your focusing has to be. If you want several things in focus at once, make the shot wider. Then everything comes into focus. Now, back to mountain bikes. 
As I said earlier, it's an industry worth $20 billion a year, and that means an awful lot of bikes to choose from. You can pay anything from 70 to 5,000 pounds, which means it's well worth doing your homework. So, to help you get it right, here's the Gadget Show's Mountain Bike Buyer's Guide. See? Now, what we're looking for is a good general purpose bike, one which will be good on and off-road, and one that's likely to last you for years but won't cost the earth. In fact, you shouldn't have to spend over 500 quid, which probably means avoiding specialist bikes like downhill. Trials and cross-country bikes. What you actually want is one of a new breed of bikes, sometimes called trails bikes. These take the best bits from all the specialist machines and blend them into a good all-rounder. You can still pay thousands for one of these, but we reckon if you follow a few simple rules, you can get a great bike for under £500. So, what do you need to know? The frame is the most important thing to consider. Everything else can be changed and replaced, but the frame is your bike. The heavier it is, the harder it is to pedal, so you want a light aluminium frame. There was a time when aluminium frames were very fragile, but now they're light and offer tremendous strength. And it's what most bikes are made of these days, so you'll get the widest choice. Wheels are simple. You want them to be strong and light. Strong because they're the bit of the bike that's going to take all the off-road punishment and light so they don't take too much effort to turn. You can have traditional rim brakes that grip the outer rim of the wheel. The problem with these is when you go anywhere wet or muddy. The rims are going to get really mucky and that's going to reduce the grip available for the brake pads. See, you're much better off having disc brakes. They're located in the centre of the wheel and are far more likely to stay clean and dry and effective. Suspension does look pretty cool, but it doesn't mean you need it. Pretty much every bike worth its salt has front suspension these days, but unless you intend to take downhill riding very seriously, you can do without rear suspension. Remember, we want a great bike for under 500 quid, and at that price, a complicated suspension rig could mean the manufacturers cut corners elsewhere. When it comes to gears, you can just go with the right manufacturers. If your bike has gears made by either Shimano or SRAM, then you've got the best there are. Nobody loves internet shopping more than the gadget show, but when it comes to bikes, you've got to head to a specialist shop. They're nearly always run by enthusiasts who know their subject inside out and they'll offer you good support long after you've handed over the money. As I said earlier, there are thousands of mountain bikes out there to choose from, but hopefully we've slimmed the field down a bit for you. And now we'll slim it down even further as I show you our three favourites for under £500. Firstly, this, the Gary Fisher Marlin, which we've seen for just £450. This is a good solid bike and comes highly recommended for those of you looking for an everyday bike that'll also perform in the mucky stuff should you decide to get serious with your off-roading. Next up, the Specialised Hard Rock Pro, a chunky and good-looking bike. It's refined enough for cross-country cruising, but tough enough to also handle aggressive downhill. In standard mode, this bike's already well kitted out, yet stays within our £500 limit. What bike you actually buy will always come down to personal choice, but our favourite mountain bike is the Marin Northside Trail, available for around £475. It's solid, straightforward and extremely competent. In fact, unless you're a pro rider, this'll handle everything you can throw at it and more. 
It's also light, good looking and has an impeccable pedigree. And remember, Marin County was where all this riding around in mud first started. So, the Gadget Show's favourite mountain bike is the Marin Northside Trail. This is the best-selling MP3 player of all time. Since the iPod's launch in 2001, 42 million have been sold. 14 million in the last year alone. Apple's ruthless updating has helped keep it in the lead. The click wheel appeared in 2004 on the brand new iPod Mini. And while the Mini was still the best-selling music player in the world, they replaced it with the super cool Nano. A few weeks later, the big iPod was updated. This fifth generation machine has sharper lines and a bigger screen that can play video. But it hasn't all been good news. The original iPod had battery life issues. The Nano's perfect looks are easily ruined by scratches and many iPods we know of have given up after just a year of use, which really isn't good enough. So, it got us wondering whether the iPod was still king of the MP3 player heap or whether at last some serious alternatives had arrived. After a week's listening to this lot, I decided to concentrate on rivals to the big iPod, the one with the hard drive large enough to contain your entire music collection. And two contenders look particularly strong. The Toshiba Gigabeat, which outsells the iPod in Japan, apparently, and the new Creative Zen Vision M, which recently won the most prestigious award going at the Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show, where Bill Gates, no less, was seen using one. All three are similar in size and price, and all three come with software that make it fairly easy to load tunes. But having music on them is one thing. You've also got to control them, listen to them, and live with them. So we've lined up some gadget show tests to find out which one is top of the MP3 class. The whole idea of MP3 players is that you can access your music easily on the move. To test this out, I'm going to try to keep mopping with one hand while navigating from track one on one album to track six on another with the other hand. A tricky task for someone not overly blessed with coordination like myself. Under these challenging conditions, the iPod's click wheel proved the simplest to manoeuvre. The Zen's rather sensitive controls put it in second place. And it took me some time to find the new album I wanted on the Gigabeat. By the time I'd finished, this piece of floor was super shiny, and I became quite frustrated with its controls. Now, the sound test. And frankly, I'm expecting each of these three to sound much the same. But as a check, we've constructed this special broadcast ear out of Bluetech, which contains a broadcast quality microphone. And I'm going to connect the right hand earbud to it, seal it round so you can hear exactly what's going on while I listen to the left hand channel in my left ear. I've put the same rather challenging piece of classical music onto each of the players. So let's start with the iPod. Plug it in, press play. It sounds very good. You really can understand why people were so impressed by the quality of the sound coming out of such a tiny box a few years ago. The Gigabeat's next to be plugged into our blue tack ear. The sound is also impressive. The notes are clear and crisp and it's on a par with the iPod. Right, next the creative. Same track. Hit play. Just thinking about it a bit. Sounds distorted there. Quiet bit coming up. Ooh. That's oh, it sounds as though it's coming through a sort of digital mush of interference. Horrible. I tried loading a number of tracks onto the creative using varying settings and on all of them you can hear faint glitches, especially when the music's quieter. So joint first place for sound quality goes to the iPod and the Gigabeat, with the creative trailing in a poor third. The iGeneration want more than just a music player. 
and with the Gigabeat you can view photos on its rather attractive screen. But the other players do this and more. You can watch videos on both the Creative and the iPod, but side by side the Creative screen quality stands out. It also supports more video formats and has a better battery. So there's less chance of the power running out before your film ends. The Creative's also got a good FM radio and voice recording. In fact, it's feature full, which makes it a clear winner when it comes to versatility. Of course, you might not care about any of that. The priority for you could well be how stylish these things are. And the question is, can the newcomers, with their promise of exclusivity, trounce the classic good looks of the iPod? Can I, I don't know whether you venture an opinion for me on these uh, three MP3 players. Which one do you think is the most stylish? Um, so the iPod. Do you think you go with the iPod? Yeah. No, sir, I'll go with that one as well. You go with the iPod as well? Three quarters of the people we asked said they preferred the iPod. There was a real sense on our streets that it's an iconic MP3 player that's wanted not only for its looks, but also for its reputation too. In all but one of our tests, the iPod came out on top. The new boys simply can't match it, either on style or performance. Which is a pity, really, because the iPod isn't a perfect MP3 player. A perfect player wouldn't make you load your music onto it through iTunes or any other particular piece of software, but it would have a built-in FM and DAB radio and, crucially, a battery you could replace yourself without an expensive repair bill. When a player that does all that comes along, the iPod really will have a serious rival. printing an ear oh. and here you can see sort of a 3d file of what the ear would look like and if I can sort of drive around and show you that it's actually flat so that but it'll... now it was time to complete my quest I wanted to see myself in the game as a proper virtual